Good morning. Pastor Sean here. Today is uh, Friday, February 16th, and this is your morning prayer. So let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, we have Ephesians chapter day, another wonderful book. Um, uh, this is uh, similar to uh, the previous letter, um, what we have yesterday, Colossians. How, um, you know, it is not, um, it, it, unlike Corinthians, it's not being written to a congregation as, as a corrective, you know, trying to um, restore peace or unity to the congregation. Um, this is kind of a, an encouragement letter to, um, to just kind of uh, speak some truths about uh, the, the unity in Christ that they have, the, the purpose of the gospel, um, the power of God and all that, and some encouragement along lo the lines of, um, you know, how to live this out, you know, put on the armor of God. That's a, a, a nice, well-known section of this letter and uh, just a lot of good stuff. Now, I will say that um, I think, and, and definitely not just this letter, but, but most of Paul's letter, what might be useful for you <laughs> as you are reading through this is to pay attention to uh, the, the headings that uh, most Bibles have um, in, in the sections that you read. Now, these, these headings, little kind of summaries of, of the section that you read, are, were not in the original text. You know, these, these, it's not like Paul put headings in his, um, in his text. So, like, when you get to a section on um, the armor of God, you know, your Bible might have in italics, you know, put on the armor of God, and then goes into the text. Um, those aren't inspired. Those aren't part of the original text. But they are certainly helpful, especially when it comes to Paul. Because, as as you have probably seen um, and are well uh, accustomed to, is Paul likes to write very, very long sentences. Uh, sometimes he can have one sentence that is effectively an entire paragraph. And there are so many twists and turns in his sentences that sometimes you have to just slow down and almost graph each sentence to figure out, okay, what is the main point that he's saying here? Because it kind of branches off 20 different times. Um, so these headings actually might be very useful for you um, to try to sort of keep a keep an idea of okay what is he talking about here <laughs> what is what's the 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 focal point what am I supposed to be zeroing in on um, so that's just a, a little help <laughs> that uh, hopefully that can help you with uh, making sense of some of his his very um, very good and very complex arguments. All right, so as to the actual content of the text today, there were just a, a few things that I wanted to point out, um, three things that jumped out as um, portions of, of Ephesians that I've, in the past, people have had issues with or questions about. Um, most of the letter, nobody has issues with. You know, it's very straightforward, very understandable, but these three are, are things that I've, I've gotten questioned on repeatedly. So the first, well, oh, I'm sorry. The first one is not something I have a question on, but this is probably the most well-known part of Ephesians, one that, that everyone can, um, can quote is Ephesians 2, uh, verses 8 and 9, and really verses 8, 9, and 10. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God had prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So this is, um, you know, held up as a very Lutheran kind of verse, you know, especially because it talks about how we are saved by faith um, or by grace through faith, uh, not as a result of works. So, you know, works right out. Um, and usually verses eight and nine, those are like typical confirmation verses. Um, but chap verse 10 is is very important uh, because usually um, in, the, in the past, um, Lutherans kind of stopped at verse nine. You know, not a result of works. Yes, we are we are against works righteousness. But verse 10 indicates to us that we were created in Christ Jesus for good works. Okay, so um, yes, good works are an integral part of our faith, a necessary part of our faith. 
Okay. Um, but not as a, um, not necessary in terms of we need good works for salvation. We're saved by grace and faith, but we need good works and they're necessary for us because we've been created for them. They've been prepared for us to walk in. Um, this is what flows from our faith. So this goes kind of back to the James text, you know, faith without works is dead. Um, works are not necessary for their, our salvation, but they're a necessary part of faith um, because they, they grow out of faith. Um, if, if you have no good works and you're claiming to have faith, something's wrong. <laughs> um, so that's a, a, a big one right there. Um, the first one that, that I think people have, um, have some issues with or questions about would be Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. Um, For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And so people come to that and, and they, they read that and say, oh, well, how, well, anyone or everyone who is sexually immoral or impure. Um, and of course, we go back to what Jesus says about uh, the commandment where, you know, anyone who even has lust in his heart is, is an adulterer. Anyone who, who uh, looks lustfully at, at someone who is not their, their husband or wife is an adulterer. Any, any kind of sexual um, activity thought, desire that transcends the bonds of marriage is adultery. So wouldn't that make everyone sexually immoral or impure in some fashion um, who is covetous? That is an idolater. And we might think, well, we, we are all covetous at, you know, we are all idolaters to a degree. Um, you know, we, we find all sorts of things to place our trust in besides God. Um, so does that mean that nobody has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. What does that mean? And of course, we're, we're not talking about um, just, you know, those who are sinners, because if Paul was saying, you know, sinners have no place in the kingdom of God, well, then <laughs> the kingdom of God is a pretty empty place. Um, you know, we are all sinners. What he's referring to is not just, um, is not people who sin, you know, like forgiven people who are, who sin, but those who, um, who persist in that to the degree that they no longer seek repentance for it, that they don't see it as an issue. So, um, you know, those who have, who struggle with lustful thoughts, those who uh, struggle with uh, idolatry in various forms, um, you know, all Christians struggle with these things in, in some way or fashion. Um, and we recognize that as sin and we, we repent of that. We seek forgiveness, even if it's something that we struggle again and again and again, even if it's a, a constant struggle, we recognize our sinfulness and we confess it to God and, and we receive forgiveness. That means that is being in the kingdom of God. Okay, It is when we get to the, the point where we no longer seek that forgiveness, where we reject it, where we so fully identify in our sinfulness that it is no longer sin for us. We, we just, we don't recognize the need for forgiveness. Um, and therefore, we, we place ourselves outside the kingdom. So that's what he's talking about there. So there's that. Um, with a minute and a half, two minutes left, get to this section. Um, the other one, of course, is, is Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33, wives and husbands. This is the one that always uh, gets people um, worked up. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. So, um, the, 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 the issue that most people have with this is the way, um, a wife's submission to her husband has been, um, abused and, um, really perverted and twisted throughout the years and how, um, this text will oftentimes be brought up as kind of a, you know, a club to, to kind of beat over the, the head of the wife saying, you must submit, you must submit, you know, and, and setting the husband as, as Lord over her because I'm as rice as Lord of the church. So I, I'm, I'm your Lord and you must submit to me. You have to, you know, do everything I say and, and whatever. You just have to be quiet and respectful and submit. This is not the kind of submission that he's talking about here. Okay. First of all, wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Okay. So the, the wives, um, the wife's role um, in, in the marriage is to respect and submit to her husband, okay? As the church submits to Christ, okay? So you have that picture of Christ and the church, 
and the church submits to Christ. Well, the, what does that mean? The, the, the church um, looks to Christ for as, as, as her leader, as, as, as the head, as the one who, who guides along, who provides for, who, who um, uh, you know, leads the way. All right, so what does the husband do? The husband loves his wife. Okay, um, but not just loving his wife. He loves his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So we look at how did Christ love his church? Well, in humility, for starters, um, becoming a servant, right? Serving the church. Um, you know, Jesus Christ came not to uh, be served, but to serve. And by giving his life up for her, even dying for her. So the husband's role in this is to humbly serve his wife in love, even giving up himself for her, denying himself for her. So you see, the, the whole thing um, works together. See, what we, uh, you know, our common um, understanding of, of marriage dynamics and all that, we, we can't see how this, this could possibly work. But within the relationship of Christ and his church, we see how this works because um, a, a wife submitting to her husband is a lot easier, you know, placing her trust in him and following his leadership um, and, and um, respecting him as the head works a lot better when that husband is humbly submitting himself in service to her, uh, denying himself, lifting her up, and even going so far as to dying for her. Um, that is the proper role of the husband is to serve his wife in that way. Um, and so when, when those two come together like that, then it makes a lot more sense. And it actually like, okay, I, I can see how this can work. Um, unfortunately, we are sinful people and uh, we will not always live these, these ways. And we will, um, you know, not want to submit or love the way that Paul instructs us to here. Um, so this is very, can be very difficult and challenging, but this is what we seek out. Um, it is not a, you know, when we talk about wives submission to husbands, um, it's not a lording over. It's not a, um, it's not a, uh, like, what do I want to say? Uh, you know, like a dictatorship or, or anything like that, you know, anything that is, um, based on fear or, or compulsion or anything like that. It is a, a mutual giving of each other um, and, and living in, in humility and, and service to one another um, and uh, lifting each other up in Christ. Forgiveness, grace, mercy, you know, those are supposed to be the, the foundations of, of love and marriage. So uh, there's, you know, there's a lot to that. Um, of course, I don't have time to get into it more than that, but uh, that that should be a good jumping off point for you. So, so there you go, Ephesians. Uh, a lot of a lot of good stuff in there. So uh, enjoy that today. Let us pray. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Blessings to you on this Friday. Hope you have a great day. Hope your week has gone well. And uh, we'll be back at it tomorrow. So until then, peace be with you.